Hailing frequencies open, and welcome to Star Trek Discoverage, the live podcast that boldly goes into excruciating detail about this week's episode of Star Trek Lower Decks. I'm your host, Aaron Coker, a.k.a. Caliban, and Captain Freeman Day is going to be awkward this year, but Captain Dayton Day is totally canceled. Join, joining me on this show, as usual, is my co-host. She's the co-host of the Generations Geek podcast, a more or less family-friendly celebration of geekdom. It's Ella Pearson. Ella, welcome back to Discoverage. Thank you. Ella, we did it. We, <laughs> we made, made it. it to the 10th the week of season. 23 weeks of track. <laughs> <laughs> you sound so unhinged. We, well, I'm wondering what I'm going to be like at week 20, but we'll see. We'll <laughs> We'll see. We're going to make it no matter what. Uh, also returning to the show tonight, he's a science fiction author and editor. He is the canon editor for Modifius Games' Star Trek Adventures RPG. And he's also the other co-host of the Generations Geek podcast. It's Scott Pearson. Scott, welcome back to the show. Hey, happy to be here. It's great to have you here and haven't talked to you in a while. So uh, it's great to catch up. Uh, I heard that you had a new story published in an anthology. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I have a gothic science fiction story called The Ghosts of Glenmirror, and that is in the Castle of Horror 4 anthology that is available to order right now from Amazon for Kindle or as a POD hard copy book that you can hold in your hands and turn the pages. That is awesome, and that's, <laughs> that's fascinating. Uh, when I think of gothic sci-fi, mm, still thinking, ticking over, uh, the big cat episode of Star Trek. <laughs> like what, what, what characterizes yes. uh, gothic sci-fi? Well, the theme of the anthology is gothic in nature. That sure. the theme is women running from houses. <laughs> that that <laughs> and, sounds about right. Okay. <laughs> and if you if you if you Google that phrase, you will and look at the images that come up there are all these great covers from gothic romance novels of the 60s and 70s that always feature a woman running like you know toward the camera essentially uh, right. from a silhouette house on the hill that's a castle <laughs> or otherwise foreboding uh and it's got all the elements the motifs of say like the classic novel rebecca yeah. So, you know, yes. it's got elements of romance, uh, maybe hints of supernatural, uh, a little bit of gaslighting going on. Sure, sure. And uh, the literary I, kind. It's OK. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I really wanted to go full on gothic with the themes, but I didn't want to write a, a something, a period piece. Yeah. And so there's a VR kind of element to my story Ooh. to bring in. Uh, the the real hardcore gothic stuff. So yeah. that's what makes it both gothic and sci-fi. Well, that sounds fascinating. I'm picturing, you know, someone in like uh, something flowy and white, possibly diaphanous, uh, you know, running down some steps away from a giant yep. house. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And maybe a with silhouette. VR goggles on. Yeah. <laughs> and and then there's a uh, you know a threatening masculine figure in the shadows. That <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. I always thought Oculus Rift was a was a very ominous name for something that you put on your head and yeah. takes you to another world. But okay, and people can check that out, like you said, uh, on Kindle, right? Yep. All right. Well, that sounds great. Check that out. Uh, I know that you have been dealing, like we all have, with the quarantine in your own way. And I heard that you were uh, currently engaged in a long read of Star Trek comic books. Yes, I started this. A ridiculously long time ago and I've been going very slowly but now I'm trying to do one a week uh, but the idea is is that I'm starting at the beginning with the gold key comics yeah and I just want to read uh, you know one a week and just work my way through all the decades of comic books I'm hoping to do it in a slightly less time than they were published in real time yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so that's why i'm really trying to step it up and do at least one a week um star, star trek is such a great example the star trek comics of a medium's sort of response to what it's licensed from uh because like in some of the early gold key comics they're just making stuff up stuff up like off the off the top of the head and just introducing things and characters are acting however 
And then later yeah. on, when, when you get to like the the DC, I think it was the DC run where the movies are going on and they're you know cooking along, and then they blow up the Enterprise, and it's like, oh, they blew up the Enterprise. Uh, we have to find a way to keep them out in space still while the Enterprise is blown up. Yeah, there's the yeah those weird in between the movies things where they yeah. tried to. They had to sort of maintain continuity to the best of their ability, but they had to make up these stories in between and then sink back in with the movie when the next movie came out. That's crazy. And um, I'm also looking forward to reading the British uh, strips. There was a Star Trek comic yeah. strip that ran in England, and those things are crazy. The The vehicles in them look like they're out of a Jerry Anderson you know, <laughs> show. And uh, some of those are even crazier than the gold keys, which are kind of infamous for being way out there compared to the TV series. Yeah. Yeah. I really love uh, some of those old comics. Um, I also like the new ones too. Uh, the IDW stuff. Um, yeah. The, the fill-ins for discovery and Picard uh, I found to be very well-written, very fascinating. Yeah. They're doing some great stuff over at IDW. Absolutely. Well, this is the part of the show where we usually talk about the news in the world of Star Trek, but there's nothing much to report on except for this small blurb here <laughs> that Kate Mulgrew is returning <laughs> to the role of Captain Janeway on Star Trek Prodigy. <laughs> Kate Mulgrew, presumably in animated form, will be appearing on the animated Prodigy, Prod, Prodigy, get that right, series. It was announced at the end of the Star Trek panel at today's New York Virtual Comic Con. And this is this is incredible. This is unbelievable. I feel like almost every other week on either this show or Enterprising Individuals, we're saying, where's Kate Mulgrew? Let's get her back in the mix. Often the scenarios we concoct are an academy situation or a mentorship situation. So, uh, you know, you're welcome for whatever positive vibes might have been sent <laughs> your way in terms of developing that idea. But I think this is really great. It is. And it's such great timing that it coincides with Riker and Troy being on lower decks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we have Kate coming back as well as Janeway. Yeah. Ella, do you have an opinion? <laughs> <laughs> Ella's wrestling her cat. Um as <laughs> as usual, I did not hear about this until Oh, she's recovering it. still. Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Totally understand. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say what Kate Mulcrew said about the announcement. She said, quote, I have invested every scintilla oh, of my being in Captain Janeway, <laughs> and I can't wait to endow her with nuance that I never did before in Star Trek Prodigy. How thrilling to be able to introduce into these young minds an idea that has elevated the world for decades to be at the helm again is going to be deeply gratifying in a new way for me. And oh, yeah. God, so, I love her. She'll be at the helm. She'll be, is that, will she be piloting? Or is that just figurative? Will she be commanding the ship? I'm always combing through for these little things. <laughs> I'm just trying to breathe. I got one person that can't breathe and one person that can't say anything. So maybe I'll just move on and say that <laughs> Star Trek Prodigy is set. That must have been a tough one to sit on. Star Trek Prodigy, Prodigy is set to premiere next year on Nickelodeon. That's Nickelodeon with eight Nicks. Uh, I also wanted to remind people again that the Trek the Vote project we talked about previously is still seeking volunteers. If you want to get involved with protecting democracy this election season, you can go to trekthe.vote, a grassroots fan-driven volunteer drive whose mission is to connect American Star Trek fans with nonpartisan groups who are working to ensure a fair, equitable uh, electoral process in our communities. If you've thought about volunteering your time as a poll worker or helping potential voters get registered to vote and locating their polling places, Trek the Vote is organizing eager Trek fans to do just that. Go to trekthe.vote for more information. You can also check your own registration status and finding polling places at trekthe.vote. So check that out. Well, we've just um, seen the... I voted early today. You did. In fact, yes, I... I did. So everyone, please vote. I um, spent time researching on if it's okay to register twice at the same address is what I did because I got a non <laughs> I got a non registered absentee ballot and it's got a form and then I was like I bet the internet is so and so and then I went on the internet and I was able to register and they said yeah you're registered and I was like great 
but then I've got a I was say I requested I got a mail-in ballot mailed to me and then I got scared because I generally am a very suspicious person and <laughs> I I um was like I'm just gonna go there and do it and I went there and I did it and they invalidated my old mail-in ballot so I was able to vote there today oh well, maybe that's and it's super easy and it took like 10 minutes that's what I'll do then when did you go um, it was a line short it was so short well we waited for like a minute outside um yeah. and then we went in and it was super easy we just filled out the thing um make sure you have your driver's license or whatever id you have so you can write down your little number sure um and it was super easy and super safe and um everyone go vote and then me and my roommate had a very dramatic hug right outside the <laughs> polling place he was like we did it and then we like hugged the music <laughs> um, swells yeah Literally, well, yeah. Maybe so that's what, so fun. It's so easy. To be safe, maybe that's what I'll do. But uh, questions like this can be answered by volunteers at trekthe.vote. So check that out. Uh, we've just seen the last episode of the first season of Lower Decks, an episode called No Small Parts, and we're here to talk all about it. But first, as always, a warning. We are setting a course for the spoiler zone, listeners. So be warned. We're glad you've decided to join us. But if you haven't seen the episode, spoilers are incoming. The official synopsis for No Small Parts is the USS Cerritos encounters a familiar enemy. Tendi helps a struggling recruit to find her footing. This episode was written by... Uh, I don't think I have that information. <laughs> this episode was written by Mike McMahon. <laughs> Actually, I do know that information. Uh, who, of course, is the showrunner for the show and wrote the pilot. And I can't remember if he's written any other episodes. But uh, this definitely, I think, has his... Um, particular particular mark uh, on the episode. There is no in-universe date given for this episode. Um, I don't believe. I mean, it takes place in 2380, of course. And here are some quirky facts about the episode. Uh, the title, of course, comes from the aphorism, there are no small parts, only small actors. Uh, nobody knows where this came from exactly, but it's a saying that most actors know. It's been attributed to the Russian director, Konstantin Stanislavsky. Which is no comfort when a casting director says it while trying to explain why you're playing Cop 2 in your college production. <laughs> a, a view from the bridge. The guy playing Alfieri wasn't even a theater student. I would have been perfect for it. But anyway, <laughs> that's where it comes from. Uh, you know, I missed this in the episode, but apparently one of Mariner's contraband items was a Remco 1976 Star Trek Space Fun Helmet toy, a.k.a. the Spock helmet. Yeah, I must have been looking down. Yes, the it was. When that <laughs> happened. But yeah, Somebody that was, in the uh, background was pulling it. Little little frisson to see that. Uh, what else is going on? This episode marks the introduction of William Riker and Deanna Troy into their fifth Star Trek series appearance, and Frakes makes it his sixth appearance if you include Thomas Riker on DS9. This is the first canonical appearance on screen of the USS Titan, a Luna class ship. Uh, it's been mentioned in dialogue and, of course, has had many adventures in extended media under the command of Captain Riker. And also, this episode canonizes. I guess the term TOS for the Kirk years of the original <laughs> five-year mission, although Ransom interprets the initialism as those old scientists, uh, maybe now that it's been called TOS on screen, all my British friends can stop finally saying, uh, stop saying toss and embarrassing themselves. <laughs> The guest stars in this episode include Jonathan Frakes as William T. Riker and Marina, Marina Sirtis as Dina, uh, Deanna Troy, not Dina, like uh, like Cochran calls her when he's drunk. Uh, and you know who they are. Uh, Jack McBrayer returns as Badgie in the episode. Uh, Cater Donahue appears as Peanut Hamper. Donahue is an American actress and singer. She is known for her role as Lindsay on the FXX series You're the Worst, and she played a cappella leader Alice in Pitch Perfect. Rick and Morty writer and sometime voice actor uh, Ryan Ridley returns in this episode as his his role as injured Bajoran crew member. Uh, he previously <laughs> appeared in Sick Bay in the episode Envoys. Comedian Lauren Lapkiss is in the episode as Jen, but we don't see her on screen. You only hear her in voiceover. Marin Dungey <laughs> plays the Solvang first officer in the episode. Dungey appeared previously as the gotcha reporter in the pilot episode of Picard. And there are a few other comedians and actors who appear, such as uh, Rich Fulcher, Neil Casey, and Echo Kellum. The problem is, my theory, is that Memory Alpha editors race to their screens to write a 14-paragraph summary of the events of the episode. But then they get all tired because <laughs> they stayed up late and they don't go the whole way and tell us who played who. So I have a lot of names of people who are in it. Uh, suffice, it to, suffice it to say, people who have been on the show before, but we can't connect them to specific character names. 
Uh, what did you guys think about No Small Parts? Scott, what did you think? I really enjoyed it. I've I've been really liking the the, the whole season. Uh, I mean, some I've enjoyed some episodes more than others, but overall, I've been very pleased. And oh, I, I want to make clear that unlike with Discovery and Picard, uh, where I was working on manuscripts for the novel line, um, and so was privy to a lot of behind the scenes info, I'm coming in to these to this show almost like just a regular lifelong Star Trek fan without <laughs> any any inside knowledge. So I just sure. get to sit and soak it in uh, like like a regular fan and and try to spot all the Easter eggs and know that I'm missing a lot because it goes by fast. But uh, but I really liked it and I liked uh, it was ambitious. I mean, they worked in yeah, yeah. a lot of drama and adventure and 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 stuff that goes beyond the 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 slapsticky kind of comedy origins of the show. Yeah. Yeah, um when I when it opened and I saw uh Beta 3 in the Chiron like my hand spasmed <laughs> involuntarily knowing all the easter eggs that I was going to have to write down. But uh but yeah, that was uh, that was a nice little shout out. What about you, Ella? Um I I really loved it. Um I think it's maybe I don't know if it's my favorite episode of the season, but I think it maybe is the best or at least one of the best episodes in the season. Um, yeah, I had a lot of fun when the Titan came in. Uh, I was really <laughs> losing it. Um, oh, and I, the Jerry you know, we don't get... score. Oh, yeah, God, I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah it, it hit different. It was more serious this week, which I appreciated for a finale. I thought it was amazing. Yeah, I, I think that it's definitely uh, a sign of it getting serious when... Uh, the captain says, it looks like the pack leads aren't a joke anymore, said the, <laughs> said the character on a comedy show. Uh, I, I, um, what is a joke, Aaron? Well, you know, we have gone on a 10-episode ep- exploration of that, haven't we, uh, <laughs> this fall? and uh, Our 10-week mission. I Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the last thing that I saw and just unequivocally immediately loved. And maybe love for me in Star Trek is um, the product of repetition. But I felt like this episode, and I think that it's, it's interesting that um, that McMahon returns uh, t- t- uh, to script this uh, last episode uh, as he did the pilot. Um, it just exemplifies all the things for me that I have been kind of complaining about all all season, which I won't, you know, uh, suffer you to listen to um, on this show. We'll see. Uh, but uh, but it's just like, again, once again, it's 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 edging into high fan or high fantasy, high sci fantasy, I guess. Uh, and it's trying to do comedy, and it keeps doing them kind of the same way. And I think that like Packlids just grinding grinding it out, I guess, <laughs> and like twenty years down the line. Uh, finally amassing enough people that they've ripped off, you know, to have something to really go with. Wh- I, I don't know why that would change the nature of them. Why are they like vicious and bloodthirsty now? It, to me, it just seems like a dorm room conversation bong hit. Man, what if the pack <laughs> were like, re- they had axes and they were like really crazy. And it's an idea, but it's never explored because the Titan comes in and just and just kills everybody. And so I just don't, that's the, for me, that's exemplary of the, the wild flashes of creativity that this show uh, shows, but then it lacks the will or the time perhaps to just really to follow up on it. I think you're just, I, I feel like you're trying to, that, that you've created a, a, a pigeonhole for the show that isn't of the show's making. And you keep trying to force it into that pigeonhole. <laughs> It's absolutely possible. It's absolutely <laughs> and possible. And you're not pleased with the result, but I just, I, you know, I don't feel like they have to, um, uh, you know, I don't think everything has to be a joke. I don't think, you know, I think they can play around. They can do serious. They can be funny. I, um, yeah, I, I just, I, I just think it's fun. It's a fun cartoon. Well, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's weird to yell at people who are having fun. And to, <laughs> and to yell at people who are enjoying seeing those people having fun, for sure. But like, I don't, you know, as far as them trying to be funny, it, I just don't find the jokes funny. 
So how did it, did you not, so you didn't like the episode? Not, not really. Or do you feel, you feel hesitant? Not at all? No, I thought we were on a real build from weeks previous. And then this is just <laughs> no. with, with the complicated premises and like the funny kind of clever subversion of stuff. And then this mm-hmm. is just another things explode. A lot of people die. And then some things get said like off screen that are kind of jokes, I guess. So what's, <laughs> how, how, what, what's, what's, what, what's with the joke thing? How do you define it? <laughs> Are you looking for stand-up comedy? I'm not quite sure what you mean by jokes. Like, there should be jokes. It well, can't just are... be situationally funny without there being, like, zinger lines and then, and then the, you well, know, the... Yeah, I mean, the it's laugh. all, but it's all zinger lines. When Riker appears for his... Is this his third or fourth finale appearance where he either <laughs> saves everybody or turns the computer <laughs> off? Uh, you know, and he goes, give me warp five, six, seven, eight. I mean, I think that's... That's lame, that was kind of... and it's supposed to be charming, <laughs> but I don't, I don't find it charming, and I don't think the show really gives us enough to really to find it charming. Really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Do you listen How... to the show? Yeah. How long <laughs> <you> find <laughs> it? <laughs> yeah, and also like uh, I. We'll, we'll go back to uh, you guys praising it in a second, but I wanted to say something <laughs> quick about. Again, like I think a great example is the idea of them introducing an exocomp <laughs> Starfleet character, which is a I which is a really say, funny. I say. It's a really funny idea, and it's a great premise. And then the character uh, just disappears from the episode because they don't want to do their job, and and then they come in for a Portal Two joke at the end, and I just was like, okay, all right, well, <laughs> that's having fun. I I, I, I was going to say that, that 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 one I I thought. Yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't. I was going to uh, bring that up too. Yeah. But I mean, that, I, but anyway. I'm like, I mean, cut her out. Are, everybody there? I lost you for a sec. Are you there? I'm here. Okay, sorry. Um, but yeah, but anyway, just I mean, like on the on the tip of comedy. I mean, I think this is sold as a comedy show, right? Like that's that's what they said. I mean, it can be a lot of things, and Trek can be funny and do all kinds of stuff. But I mean, this is like a waka waka show, and I just wish that. They they walk us so hard like Dewey Cox, but <laughs> but I wish that they would either walk better or just don't worry about the walking. Don't worry about it. It can be like a light show and then give that because McMahon clearly just wants to do TNG like it's just in his blood. That's where he came from. That's his his origin story. And I think that's fine to do. Mm-hmm. But there's just all this waka waka. See, I liked the jazz joke. I mean, yeah. you, you <laughs> I did. Your, I kind of laughed. You like doing the the count thing, and then what really uh, lands it is then it takes off, and you hear Troy just say, "Ah, oh, jazz." <laughs> <laughs> I did kind of like it's such a like it's such a lame dad joke. Yeah, <laughs> and I like hearing that come out of Riker's mouth. Yeah, D- Riker definitely. I don't know, maybe. We see him a lot older in Picard. I think he'd definitely be on the dad jokes at that point. But we're charting the evolution. <laughs> yeah. We're charting the evolution. This is a, a father of a newborn jokes, and then we'll get to father of a teenager <laughs> jokes later. <laughs> um, yeah, this episode is just packed solid with uh, with references um, and sort of homages to to other episodes. Uh, I thought, do, what do you guys think about the death of Shax? I was surprisingly moved by it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. it was kind of sad. Given the context of, you know, in this cartoon that uh, hasn't done anything anywhere near that serious. Yeah. And, and and then we get to see this, you know, classic Starfleet self-sacrifice thing. Uh, yeah, it 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 got me, you know. And, and the fact that he had, when they first boarded the ship, you know, he, sa- he yells, uh, you know, this is the greatest day of my life. Mm-hmm. And then it turns out to be the last day of his life, you know. Yeah. yeah. And and the th- one of the things that I've liked about the show throughout is that most of the storylines, with just a little tweak, could just be used in a straight Star Trek show. You know, they they have Star Trek ideas that would just work in a straight Star Trek show, but then they you know then they they make them goofy and they've got the goofy characters. They give the characters license to be crazy within the context of actual serious things with consequences which is just like uh, other humorous episodes 
throughout the live action series. You know, when when TOS did say, like the trouble with Tribbles, which is pretty much a, a straight out comedy in many ways. Uh, well, hanging in the balance of that episode is the poisoned grain that could have killed untold colonists on some mm-hmm. planet. So it had potentially very serious repercussions. And so I'm kind of coming at Lower Decks as the show that has just... uh, It's just leaving out all the dramatic episodes and just doing the comedy episodes. (laughs) Right, right. But they they still have the backdrop that can be serious and have serious repercussions. Perhaps that's reading too much into a 22-minute cartoon, but... (laughs) <laughs> well, it's, I, th- I think I, it's clear that that's that's what they're going for. I mean, that, I think that's definitely um, their plan. Go, go ahead, Ellen. Yeah, I, th- I think you're reading into it just enough. I was just going to say before we move on, when Shax calls Rutherford baby bear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I was like, oh, no. Anyways. I think... <laughs> yeah, I was a little sad. <laughs> um, the... Uh... I can't. Have we met the the Solvang in an earlier episode? You know, I can't remember. I can't I either. Yeah, I it, forgot to look it up. It feels it feels familiar, but I just point out that you, I you know people name ships after all kinds of stuff, and I don't live in California, but like I've started to pick up on a pattern that all the ships on this show, at least the ships of the uh, of the Cerritos class, are named after cities in in California. Um, because I, I know that I've been to Solvang. Uh, Solvang is just <laughs> is just east of Buellton, where you can get Anderson's pea soup. Um, and so, like, I know there's, like, the Sacramento, but maybe they started with, like, northern California cities when they ran out of, like, famous people and, and uh, <laughs> battles and things like that. And now they're, now they're getting down to the bottom of California. They'll be going into, into Mexico soon. You'll get the SS Baja California or something like that. <laughs> Uh, what did you guys think about the um, well, the reveal of the secret of uh, Mariner, you know, being uh, the captain's daughter to, to everyone, and how that might change the dynamic of the show uh, as we go forward? I enjoyed it. It was it was a you know a, a, a funny bit. Uh, I love how the captain. <laughs> Uh, the the way she so bodily pushed the the guy away from the, the like the ops console to <laughs> beam him up right <laughs> right, right. just yeah. like a hand right on his face just shoves him aside <laughs> yeah I also love right after that when Boimler is still doing his little kissy bit and then he opens his eyes and is like ah, 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 and then yeah, it cuts right. <laughs> yeah because you know we all know what a suck up he can be and so it's that that is like you know his worst nightmare that he's done that right in front of the captain you know <laughs> oh man yeah and he um remains a suck up uh, after the events of the episode and uh <laughs> sort of uh, t- uh plays his hand at uh, getting a, a seat on the titan um do you think that the titan will appear more in season two of the show I mean, it has to appear in the first episode. I was going to ask you that. It's like, is the next season going to be separate? Like, Mariner is still going to be on the Cerritos, and then we're going to see Boimler on the Titan with... It's possible, sure. I mean, Fritz and Cerritos are voice actors from way back. Yeah, I I would kind of like to see them do that. I think that could uh, create some nice uh, story opportunities, but... You know, who knows? They could come back with the first episode and Boimler gets bounced back to the Cerritos. Oh, yeah. You know, but uh, yeah, they could go anyway. I, 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 the, the stuff that they did in this episode, I think, demonstrates that they, you know, they can go anywhere. They, they, you know, it's going to be a more wide open show than what the uh, earlier uh, episodes of the season may have made us think. Oh, definitely. I'm I really think... interested if they do like a crossbow ships next season. It's going to be crazy, especially with. Riker and Troy, that's like wild. I like the um, the the situation they have in the uh, first part of the episode where Mariner is going to suddenly she's going to follow all the rules and drive Boimler crazy because <laughs> she has the 
capacity to do that. I, I don't know why, but it reminds me of the film Train Spotting when Ewan McGregor's character is like, man, I got to get off heroin. This is going to be really tough for me. But then his friend, uh, Johnny Lee Miller, apparently has the ability to just stop using heroin. And so he does that <laughs> as well, just to taunt uh, Ewan McGregor's character. Um, and so like Mariner doesn't like, she's not really serious about this, but she's like, Oh no, I can put my hair up. I can do that. I can just walk around and read the manual and look, Oh, no, no, let's do <laughs> this. Let's on. do that. Yeah. Oh, we're late. We got to get to yeah, the meeting. Yeah. So, uh, I like that uh, aspect of it. But then of course I also liked when they get into the crisis with the packlets and the captain's like, all right, screw it. Uh, get us out of this Mariner. Do something insane. Just go out there and screw everything up and you're, it's going to save us. She knows the uh, assets of her, of her crew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah oh man i really enjoyed it i feel like um you know i i kind of it's not like they thought super super hard like it's not like a, a super complicated finale or like whatever but i liked that it was so different from the rest of the season like the rest of the season i feel like was so lighthearted and it was like it was never super super serious and so to watch this and see like uh, Shax's sacrifice and have a lot more action and them, you know, like running the captain to uh, sick bay is like crazy. Yeah, and I thought that they had some really nice character moments. The bit with when when uh, Rutherford volunteers to go over to the Packled ship. Yeah, and and Tendy is saying something about you know, his, the, the setting on his little cyborg thing or whatever. And he's like, yeah. no, this is the normal me. And yeah. that's such a great little bit where you see that, you know, as goofy as this show is, it's like, well, he is a good Starfleet officer, his normal self, not some hyped up, you know, heroic subroutine mm -hmm. from his cyborg thing. His normal self is to, you know, say that he's going to do this because he's got the skills to do it. And then I also liked, later in the episode when he's lost his memory and he doesn't remember who Tendi is and you're just, you're ready to feel so sad for her. And then she does that thing about, you know, we get to be best friends all over again. <laughs> and, you know, and that, that was just so, you know, true to the character as she's been developed and was such a fun way to, uh, you know, so, sort of organically take us out of that sad moment and let us, you know, kind of feel cheered up a little bit because we already have lost Shaxx. So to uh, it would have been, you know, a real bummer to then watch that scene be a total sad scene. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and also way more fun because I 100% thought that he, it was going to cut back to Rutherford and he was going to say, are you my girlfriend? And oh. I was so happy this episode, that moment with Boimler and Mariner, where Boimler was like, um, you're my best friend. That's why I was so afraid that you were going to leave. And then to have that moment with Rutherford and Tendi, where she's like, we get to be best friends. Like, we get to become best friends all over again is, like, so sweet and amazing. Yeah. Well, and the, yeah. And there was a number of fun moments between Mariner and Boimler as well that showed the uh, development of their friendship, too. Yeah. Yeah. You, we, Ella, were you uh, worried about uh, what we talked about last week that uh, maybe it would have been, I don't want you to leave because I love you. Oh, I was. I was. And it's not like I wouldn't. It's not like I don't enjoy those like side romance plot lines when they happen. I love it. Listen, I love like a rom-com. <laughs> Genuinely, I love it. My favorite <laughs> movie is a rom-com. But um, it's done every time right every tv show every movie it's it's like it's always the i was afraid you would leave because i have feelings for you i was afraid you'd leave because i love you and i don't want to lose you <laughs> and it's never it's never like i didn't want you to leave because you're my best friend especially across um uh genders yeah and so to have them do that twice in one episode because then i thought oh for sure they're going to do it now with rutherford and tendy for sure it's going to be them and not uh, Mariner and Bormler. And so for them to do that twice, I was like ecstatic. Yeah. Yes. And, and uh, it's so often the way that kind of thing is, is written uh, then diminishes the role of the woman because yeah. she, she becomes, you know, like she's there to be the girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And so 
uh, I hope that they keep this throughout the series. That that they're you know they're friends, they're colleagues, they respect each other, and, and that's all it is. You know, it's like you don't have yeah. to go the other way. You can bring in other characters if you want to do a a rom com episode like they did with uh, you know what's her name the alien that uh, yeah the girlfriend <laughs> yeah that you know be- because of the alien infestation or whatever she had or he had mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm totally jumbling the plot line of that previous episode but you know what I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. I do. What did you think, Aaron? <laughs> I hope they can stay away from Badgie. <laughs> uh, I think, like, they, of course, they bring Badgie back in this episode. Um, I like the idea it... of Badgie being, um, I don't know, like their Moriarty or or their Seska <laughs> lurking in the lurking in the hollow circuits, uh, waiting to to mess things up. But, but I don't know how we go bigger with Badgie. After, no, I, uh, I, 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 it, that's a well that you don't want to go to too often, certainly. Yeah. And, and I'd be happy with, with, uh, Badgie being uh, gone now. But, yeah. I think Badgie's, uh, you know, time of death. Boomy. Yeah. Time of death. <laughs> time of death. <laughs> Delete program. Drag to trash. Well, or at least that they just, <laughs> they just never, uh, that uh, Rutherford never turns off the the safety things again because I guess the the program would still be in the hollow deck back on the Cerritos. Yeah. In theory. Well, you always leave it in the pocket though because he forgot about it, but maybe he just um, in case. remembers later or yeah, or he accidentally yeah. trips it. Yeah. Just but... in case. <laughs> Badgy point 2. Um <laughs> a long grandfather. Trip... Yeah. Well, it's a good thing there isn't a relationship between uh, Boimler and Mariner because Boimler's, uh he's got a mean streak. He's got that uh, that Starfleet thing that you need to climb up in the ranks because he <laughs> immediately takes takes that opportunity and he's on the Titan. Other than seeing possibly the Titan and other ships on the show in the future, is there anything else that you guys are looking for uh, in Season 2 of Lord Dex? I just want to say first, I too would betray my friends if I got to work on the bridge with Riker and Troy. <laughs> <laughs> I would say goodbye. I'm going to go get yelled at by Marina Sirtis for the rest of my life. And it's going to be <laughs> the best thing to ever happen. Hello, Upper Decks. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess I would just like to see more of the same. I think that they've been they've been building up. They've been finding their uh, their way uh opening things up to doing more dramatic stuff, but also still doing silly stuff. And between the, the Titan thing and then the news about Janeway, it does Uh. make me very optimistic that there could be more crossover stuff like this that really starts bringing the developing Star Trek universe together. You know, and part of me doesn't want to get my hopes up that, you know, because, you know, there's so many moving pieces in something like this, but, uh, I really like seeing those crossovers and tie-ins that really um, take advantage of the this you know multi-decade decade franchise. There's so much there that you can draw on. Yeah, yeah, I agree. The crossover episode, I Carly and Victorious type B. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, um, it's Nickelodeon. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, I can't even think of the, the $6 million man and the bionic woman. I don't know. All my references are so stale. Uh, I'd like to see more, more guest stars. They've had some, uh, some funny people, yeah. um, some, you know, comedians and comedic actors, mm-hmm. but can now that they're like 1.5 seconds of Q, can I have a Q episode, yeah, please? Maybe a little more Q. Yeah. <laughs> can I have just, a Q episode, please? Not just Star Trek people. I think we can get those, uh, you know, if they do decide to like cross over a little more, but just, they, I know that a lot of those people are part of the LA comedy community, which reaches into, um, you know, podcasts and funny shows and, and web content. And so I like them to keep my, you know, keep mining that, that vein and uh, just keep bringing um, funny personalities and funny voices to the show. We are the next guest stars. <laughs> yeah. We wow. have a podcast. <laughs> it's only about 2,500 miles too far east. We, but yeah. we moved to LA. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. A job you can do anywhere, but we've got to do it in LA. <laughs> Uh, as we wrap up here on the first season of Lower Decks, uh, any last thoughts that you guys had uh, about the episode or about the season? Yeah, I've got a couple things I wanted to mention. One of the things yeah, that I was you're... amused by uh, was how everyone just went along with the name Peanut Hamper. 
<laughs> sure. The whole crew just goes along with it. Everyone seems to know it's Peanut Hamper. Uh, and then another thing that I really liked was when everyone started sucking up to Mariner, she was mad at one guy. She said to Boimler, you know, he didn't even know my name before this. He called me Jen. Who here is named Jen? And then at the end of the episode, <laughs> that's when someone starts talking to Mariner and she says, oh, shut up, Jen. <laughs> right, yeah, right, right, right. And so that was a nice you know, callback. <laughs> and I did want to, again, mention the music because the the sort of adventure music that they were using during the Packled scenes was really great music. And I was really getting into it. And it was very effective score. And then when the Titan shows up oh, and God. they ramp up the classic Jerry Goldsmith music, that was so effective. I mean, that I was a total nostalgic just sucker for that it's the titan it's the music i'm that just really a hit. happy yeah, you know misty-eyed nerd boy when that happened yeah ella uh... i watched that scene um over again after i finished the episode and watched the disco uh trailer i watched it over again and my roommate came in and first he was like what is that because it was at the trailer and i was like that's the trailer just hold on um, and then I watched the scene over again and I, and he was like on his phone and I was like, that's the music from the show, the show that these characters are from. That's the theme from the other show. <laughs> like okay. trying to be like, right. look, look, look. <laughs> <laughs> just doing my best. <laughs> Uh, yes, um, I agree with all of that. I, I, has Jennifer been, Jennifer's been a running joke throughout the show, hasn't she? She's been, uh, isn't she the one that like, uh, Mariner shoves out of the way when she's running down the, the hall and she's like, out of my way, Jennifer. Jennifer, yeah. Oh, that right. time yeah. They, yeah, that time I they used, the nobody, ball, nobody yeah. hears name Jennifer. Shut up, Jennifer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I think that is about going to do it. Uh, we have to clear the decks because we've got another ship coming in here next week. So that's it for our show mm -hmm. this week. Thanks for joining us, listeners. And if you like what you hear, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter at EISD Pod for updates and to get notified when new episodes of both Enterprising Individuals and Discoverage are released. And you can tweet to us on the show by using the hashtag Discoverage, or you can email us at EISTPod at gmail.com. Also, while you're on the internet, why not head to your listening platform of choice and subscribe to the show feed and give us a rating and review because it really helps us out if you want to help the show grow stop by our patreon page at patreon.com forward slash eist pod and as always if you like the show tell a friend star trek discoverage will return on october 15th for the first episode of season three of star trek discovery entitled that hope is you and we will be here next Thursday to cover it. We'll be going live once again at 7 p.m. Central, so you can join us then. Follow us on Twitter or Facebook at EIST Pod to get notified when we're live and broadcasting. In the meantime, check out our main show, Enterprising Individuals, at enterprisingindividuals.com. Every Wednesday on the show, I and a special guest discuss in excruciating detail a selected episode from a Star Trek series. We also have news from the Trek Sphere and interviews with spe special guests. Our latest episode just dropped, and on it, I'm joined by the host of the Sales. Noob podcast and my co-host on Just Enough Trope and frequent Discoverage guest Mikan Hana to talk about the DS9 episode Indiscretion. That's the one where Dukat is scheming to kill his illegitimate daughter, but oh no, there's something in my butt. I gotta get this thing out of my butt. <laughs> Give me the dermal regenerator. It's a real barn burner and we have an in-depth discussion about the myth of Dukat, as I like to call it, Scrain G. Dukat Esquire. You can hear that episode at enterprisingindividuals.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Ella, thanks as always for sticking with me here in the 23 Weeks of Trek. And where can people find you online? Thank you. Um, uh, my podcast and my dad's podcast, who is here um it's called generations <laughs> geek um we are at generations geek um wherever you listen to podcasts as well as all social media and i'm happy to say that our long-awaited uh catching fire episode will be out tomorrow so tune in to find out why my father scoffy is confirmed team PETA hardcore okay. will not let out about PETA. All right. The man loves PETA. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's an accurate synopsis of my uh, point of view. I think it was very clear. <laughs> well, I've been looking forward to that episode. And Scott, it's always great to have you on the show. And where can people find you online? 
In addition to GenerationsGeek.com, you can find me at Scott-Pearson.com, and you can follow me on Twitter at, at S. Michael Pearson. And I really want everyone to go to my Twitter feed because I have a poll up on Twitter trying to decide on my new Star Trek Lower Decks catchphrase. Mm. There's only two to choose from. The first is Mariner Powers Activate. Okay, all right. And the second is Welcome to the Boim Town. <laughs> okay. All right, all right. And mm. I only have four votes so far. I, okay, I need let's, more. Let's try to get those up higher. We gotta uh, win. Well, that's a real Sophie's choice, <laughs> but I'm uh, win. yeah. <laughs> Check that out at S. Michael Pearson, all in word, on Twitter.com. Uh, and, of course, people should go check out your new story in the anthology, um, Women Running... What was that again? Women Running Away from Houses? <laughs> the, the, it was Castle of Horror 4 is Castle the main title. Uh, and the yeah, subtitle, Women Running from Houses. Women Running from Houses. Okay. <laughs> so check that out. Uh, that is it for us for now. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll be back next week for Star Trek Discovery. We're signing off. This is Aaron for Ella and Scott saying, live long and prosper. <laughs>